Hi everyone. This is Jonette Mungo, your 4-H agent, and in case you did not make it to our training that we had for Embryology Project, I'm going to go through the PowerPoint with you um, because there were things that I delivered and spoke during the presentation, and I want to make sure that you um, have all the information you have before you get started on our project. So, welcome to Incubation and Embryology. Um, I have compiled a bunch of resources for you. The University of Illinois has a great website that you can go to that um, has all kinds of lesson plans already put together for you, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. The month of March is Embryology Month, so you'll be getting your chicks on March 2nd, and they uh, you'll bring them back to me the last Friday in March. So you'll have about a week of those chicks being in your classroom for observation with your students. And I want you to, to think about what other things you can do during the month of March that will support studying eggs, embryology, the life cycle. So here on this particular website, Embryology 101 with the University of Illinois Extension, um, you have access to a lot of that. So I wanted to let you know that there's tons of resources out there for you to use for the month of March during your life cycle and embryology project. Um, and you have access to these links and things within the PowerPoint presentation. So this is the website that will take you um, to that University of Illinois um, extension page where you will have all those resources and details. Now, the first thing that you're going to need is an incubator to do this project. Um, there is a still air incubator that you can get, but that doesn't have a fan. Um, I do not recommend that. You want a circulated air incubator that has an automatic turner inside. So that way you don't have to turn and rotate your eggs throughout the day. Um, and a, a circulated incubator has a fan in it, so it keeps a constant steady temperature throughout your entire incubator. And that is going to help uh, with your humidity holding it stable and making sure there are no hot spots inside of your incubator that could possibly cook the eggs instead of incubating the eggs. So please make sure you are securing your incubator now and that you have it before your project. Um, because you will need to assemble it and run it for two weeks before you even get your eggs. It is so vitally important that you test your incubator at least two weeks before you start this project. I would even say three weeks before you start the project. So that way you know that it will hold the temperature and that you can maintain the humidity inside of your incubator. Each one of your classrooms is a different temperature. So your incubator temperature setting will you you might have to adjust it and play with it just based upon the air temperature within your classroom and you know these styrofoam incubators are really good incubators but they don't last forever and so having a period of testing them out makes sure that you know you have a working incubator two days prior to uh, setting your eggs you need to have your incubators up and running okay if you didn't do this last year please make sure you do this this year because the name of the game is increasing our hatch rate. So two weeks, no less than two weeks before starting the project, you're gonna test out your incubator, make sure it runs. Two days prior to, turn your incubator on and have it run. It'll be empty, but make sure you have it at the temperature, holding steady with the humidity when you get your eggs. Make sure that you clean your incubator before you get started this year. Please remember, our eggs are porous, so they absorb things through the shell. That includes oxygen, bacteria, germs, um, anything that could have been left over from last year's hatch, anything from manufacturing. So you want to start with a clean incubator. Nobody starts cooking in their kitchen in a pan that's already dirty because you get cross-contamination. The same thing happens with their eggs. So one teaspoon of Clorox to one gallon of water or mild dish uh, water soap okay so make sure your incubator is clean that includes your egg turner if you have an automatic egg turner that also includes the grid at the bottom of your incubator and the actual bottom of your incubator um, where shells and pieces from the last hatch and even yolk could um, accumulate at the bottom and cause some bacteria growth and build up 
within your incubator. So you wanna make sure everything is clean. Um, also make sure that your fan that's inside of your incubator is also clean and that there's no leftover down that is uh, accumulated from last year on your heater coil that is inside of your incubator or um, your uh, thermostat that's in there. So in your incubator, um, you should have a thermometer. There are uh, digital incubators right now that has a thermometer and things on the top of your incubator. If you buy one, um, if you bought one recently, it'll probably most likely be digital if you have a styrofoam one. Um, if not, then you can also purchase a thermometer to lay inside of your um, of your incubator, but you have to know what that temperature is and what the temperature is close to your eggs. It doesn't matter about the air around it. What is it right at um, your egg temperature? So you can lay it on the grate with your eggs or lay it on top of your eggs and that'll be fine. Just make sure you wash it if you're gonna put it on your eggs. Um, the wafer at the bottom, right down here is an older style. So in order to set that one, you will turn that thermometer one direction or the other to turn the temperature up or turn the temperature down. So running your incubator for two weeks prior to the start of this project will let you know that you, you have adjusted it correctly and that the temperature is set to where it needs to be. Again, set up your incubator two days prior to getting your eggs. Everyone's eggs will reach you or you'll pick up your eggs on March 2nd. So that means February 28th, you need to have your incubator set up and running in preparation for those eggs. Make sure you set your incubator in a corner of a room that is not drafty and that is not in front of a window because the sunshine coming in the window will affect the temperature inside of your incubator during the day and then it's going to cool off and drop down lower at night and so you're going to get a serious influx of temperatures inside of that incubator because your incubator has a window and of course light is heat and so that direct sunlight could change the temperature inside your incubator okay so please keep that in mind drafts blowing down remember you have vent plugs at the top of your incubator and there are also holes on the bottom of your incubator to make the air circulation happen and to have an exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen inside of your incubator so you want to make sure you keep it away from drafts so that the cold air does not impact and influence your incubator um, you want your room temperature ideally between 70 and 75 degrees. I know in schools you don't always have um, the freedom and flexibility to control that, which again is why it is so important for you to set up your incubator and test it out at least two weeks prior to getting your eggs. I encourage you to put a sign on your incubator that says experiment in progress, do not touch, do not open, do not disturb. So that way random people or students won't come into your room and wanna touch the eggs and do these things because they will introduce germs and bacteria from their hands into your project and that can mess up your data and affect your chicks from hatching, okay? Again, it's a porous, egg so whatever is on your hands gets absorbed onto the surface of that egg and gets absorbed into the egg which can create um, developmental delays in your chicken um, and it can also create disease with your chick that will render your embryo um, unable to complete so you don't want that happening. We wanna increase the hatch rate and that means keeping your environment sterile and protecting those eggs from um, being introduced to anything that could affect the development of that embryo. Um, so adjust your temperatures over two hour period. So let it run for two hours before you adjust it again. So if you have to make a small adjustment, wait two hours, see where it is and then adjust it. Don't do it and don't give it 10 or 15, give it two hours. So your incubator, you have a bottom. Again, the bottom has vent holes for air circulation. There should be some type of grate at the bottom that keeps eggshells and things from falling directly into the water. You have a top, the red light arrows, wing nut um, for an incubator of this style, and then you have an electric plug, and then you have vent plugs. Those vent plugs are to help regulate the humidity inside of your incubator. If you see moisture, condensation, on the lid or the window of your incubator, your, your humidity is too high. Pop one of the vent plugs or pull the tape back so that 
the uh, humidity can escape to give a better balance. So the whole thing of incubation, number one is to start with a fertile egg. I am providing you fertile eggs from a hatchery in Nottoway or Crew, Virginia. The next thing is your temperature. You want your temperature to be steady. You don't want it to be so hot that it cooks your egg, but if it's too cool, then your embryo will take longer to develop if develop at all. Um, you wanna make sure your humidity is set right because if the humidity isn't set right, then that membrane on the inside of that eggshell will dry out and that's going to affect the oxygen exchange, but it'll also shrink wrap your chick and give it less space to develop inside the egg, which could therefore impact the um, development or viability of your, um, your fetus and that, that um, embryo inside. Ventilation matters. Remember, these are aerobic processes in cell division and development, so it needs oxygen. So ventilation is important to have an exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And then, of course, turning the eggs. Without turning the eggs, that egg can get stuck on one side and it will not develop and therefore will not hatch. Fertile eggs. When you get your eggs, I am picking these eggs up on March 1st and I'm gonna keep them at a cool temperature, okay, until you pick them up on um, the following morning on March 2nd. So you wanna have your incubator up and running, okay? So you're gonna have your eggs, you're gonna put them in your incubator, okay? Do not wash your eggs, okay? If, if they're dirty and you think it's too dirty, just get really fine grit sandpaper and just sand down anything that's rough, but you shouldn't have to do anything with the eggs um, when, when I get them from the hatchery, okay? You do not wash your egg. When chickens lay eggs, they lay a bloom around an egg that protects it, that helps to seal it, and it actually lasts longer and keeps it um, fertile, okay? Or it keeps it safe from absorbing a lot of things from the atmosphere. Even grocery stores will coat eggs with a mineral oil substance to kind of keep the pores closed up so it doesn't absorb bacteria in transit. It actually makes your eggs last longer. So even after you get your eggs from the grocery store, if you put another very light coating of mineral oil on your eggs, they'll keep longer. So please Please do not wash the eggs. Um, and besides that, again, any soap, detergent, whatever you use on those eggs, it gets absorbed and it will impact your undeveloped um, embryo. Allow your eggs to warm to room temperature prior to setting. Now, before you all pick up your eggs from me, they will already be set at the room temperature that's here in our building, which typically is set around 72, 73 degrees. Okay, so it's gonna be an ideal temperature for you already. So you should be able to go to your classroom and put them in um, your incubators that are already running. Okay, but if if not, then leave them out to sit for 30 minutes to two hours, but please make sure you get them in the incubator on March 2nd. The temperature of your incubator needs to be set between 99 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit in a circulated air incubator, okay? Now, if you look at the picture here, you'll see that there are two thermometers in there. One thermometer is resting on top of the eggs, and then the other thermometer is under the grid that's uh, there. So one of those is going to be a thermometer um, that's giving you the, humi the humidity reading, so a hydrometer, and then the other one is going to give you the temperature reading that's in there. So you'll need to read um, those to make sure they're steady. A temperature that's too high, 103 degrees Fahrenheit for four hours or more, you're cooking your eggs, okay? So you're you're not gonna get eggs that hatch, all right? If you set your temperature too low, under 99 degrees, then it's gonna be a very slow developing egg if it develops at all. So two thermometers are preferred, one for humidity, one for temperature. You can do digital or you can do the, the analog ones that you see there. Still air, no fan, you're gonna to have to manually turn, um, but again, you want 99 to 100 degree temperature Fahrenheit, regardless, that temperature has to stay within that range. When you first put your eggs in your incubator, expect the temperature to drop. Do not adjust the temperature on your incubator when this happens. Remember, your incubator is gonna be set at 99 to 100 degrees, okay? Now, the eggs in your room are gonna be at room temperature. So that's lower than the 99 degrees in your incubator. So those eggs are going to absorb the heat. They're also going to absorb the humidity within that incubator. Once they reach a point of stasis, 
your temperature will adjust back to where it was. So you do not need to adjust your heat upwards for at least the first 48 hours, okay? Do not overheat during the first 48 to 72 hours because it is going to cook your embryo and it is going to um, affect your, your, your eggs are not gonna be viable any longer. So please, 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 please don't adjust your temperature. I expect it to drop as the eggs absorb the heat, reach the right temperature, it will all stable and level out. But do keep a watch on the humidity as well. The humidity, unless your instructions say otherwise, you are going to fill up the outside water channels. So in the picture that you see here, you see that here, um, hopefully you can see my mouse, the outside channels run here and then they run here. Oops. Okay. Those are the ones you're going to fill up for days one through 17. Okay. You're going to fill up these outside channels here to maintain the humidity. On days 18 through 21, you're going to fill the outside and the inside channels because when that when that chick is developing inside of the egg you need to keep that membrane moist so that that chicken can break through to come out of that egg and they are going to be absorbing a lot of humidity so you have to increase the humidity okay but one thing you do not want to do is get water or have condensation on the outside of those eggs okay you do not want that because where there is water there is bacteria okay so you do not want to do that um, and then you don't know what's in your water so if your incubator says to spritz water inside to increase the humidity please don't please don't do that and it may say use distilled water please don't because your bottle on the inside the sprayer you don't know what other things it could pick up use a turkey baster add warm water to the bottom tray warm water don't add cold water in there warm water because that'll drop the temperature and change the environment of that egg so you want to put that water directly onto the bottom of the tray without getting it on the egg so a turkey base or a meat baser will help you to do that or you could add like really soaking wet sponges in there and set them in there to increase the humidity as well okay so the relative humidity that you need for days one through 17 is 60 percent but as you move into day 18 to 21 you want your relative humidity set at 65 to 70 percent okay that helps your chick to not be shrink wrapped inside that egg as they're trying to um, emerge and hatch out so with your circulated air um, incubator add water to the outer trough days 1 through 17 days 18 through 21 because we're getting close to this hatch right here that's when you want to fill both of those bottom trays in there okay um but again if hopefully none of you will have a a, a still air incubator um if condensation forms on the inside of window or on the eggs remove one of the plugs to lower the humidity which um i told you before so um you do not need to make a wet bulb thermometer just get a thermometer that measures humidity okay and put it in there don't trouble yourself with this right here but you do need to make sure that you have the relative humidity set appropriately for days 1 through 17 and then 18 through 21 increase that okay so the vent holes on the bottom of the incubator allows oxygen in and the carbon dioxide out again you got to have that exchange so it's really important that uh, the holes in the bottom help with that and then your vent plugs at the top um, of your lid have that as well so please keep an eye on that so turning your eggs you're going to lay your eggs flat so you'll notice when you lay your egg flat that you have one end that's wider and one end that's more narrow okay so if you are going to have your eggs laying on the side like that mark one side with an x the other side with an o do not use a sharpie please do not use a sharpie or a marker because remember your eggshell is porous if you put a sharpie and a very wet marker on the outside of that eggshell your chickens will come out marked okay they absorb through that eggshell and you don't want whatever chemical is in those markers or sharpie to impact your um your developing embryo inside of that egg and there were some teachers who had chicks that came out marked so use a pencil or a wax crayon to mark your eggshell okay now 
the number on each large end. So again, when you lay your egg out flat, you'll notice that one end is really wide and the other end is narrow. When you set your eggs, if you have an automatic egg turner which gently rocks them like this, so you need to put the fat end at the top and the narrow end down. If you didn't do this last year, you probably did not have a very good hatch rate, okay? Um, not good. The wider end of your egg has to be up, okay? Or pointed out if you have a rolling one that rolls your egg this way, okay? Because then it'll turn it over as your grid just rolls in a circle, okay? But if you have the one that gently rocks it this way, the fat end has to be at the top. That's where the air pocket and the air bubble is. That's where your chick's head will be, okay? So as they're breaking through and pipping through, that air bubble that's at the top of that wide end of your egg is the first breath that they take as they start to pip out and break through that shell. If you put the fat end down, you're basically putting a chicken on its head. Okay, it's not gonna survive, it's gonna suffocate and the weight of itself is gonna crush its head, okay? So you don't want that to happen. The fat end goes up, the skinny end goes down, okay? If you do not have an automatic egg turner, you're gonna need to turn your eggs, roll your eggs three to five times a day. So I would roll them in the morning when you get to school, roll them again at lunchtime, and then roll them again um, right before you leave school, okay? But if you can, please get an automatic egg turner because then you don't have to worry about coming back to school on the weekends to turn your eggs, all right? So you're gonna turn your eggs um, from day zero, which is the day you actually get your eggs, to and then day one um, until the end of day 17, you're gonna need to turn your eggs. Now listen, the last four days, okay, of your hatch, do not turn your eggs, okay? 18, 19, 20, day 21. 18, day 18 through the 21st, do not turn your eggs. If you have an automatic egg turner that rocks your eggs this way, okay? Take your eggs off of the egg turner. Take the entire egg turner out of your incubator, okay? Because you don't want these eggs hatching and then the chicks get stuck inside the egg turner, okay? And then they'll die. So take them out. It's okay to lay them flat because when they're hatching, they're going to be rocking and rolling and moving around and you don't want them to get stuck. You want them to have that grid, that plastic grid in the bottom. That's a flat, stable surface for them to stand up on, okay, and to hatch out of, all right? So take your egg turner out. If you have one of those ones that rocks your egg this way, if it's already flat and it's rolling, you should be okay as long as it does not pre uh, present a um, problem for your eggs or your chicks as they're starting to hatch, okay? But do not turn them the last four days. And you all have been provided a calendar and that says that on the calendar as well. Do not turn your eggs, take them off of the egg turner. So these are the reasons for a poor hatch. Our uh, hatch rate last year was pretty bad. We set 100, or 810 eggs and we hatched like, what did I say, 324? That's a 40% hatch rate. That's pretty bad. Okay, we should be doing better hatch rates than that. So we know the eggs are fertile, so we know that infertile eggs are not an issue. But temperature could be an issue, the humidity, the ventilation, and the turning. So that's why we're doing the training and I really want you all to, to, uh, to follow these instructions so that way we will see an increase in our hatch rate this year. So you will have to monitor this. And for those of you that um, experienced issues last year on the weekends with your schools, um, there were some who said that they set up a webcam so they could you know, log in and watch it over the weekend to see what was happening to make sure things were stable. If you're noticing things are happening on the weekend that could affect your hatch rate, I know it's work, but you may need to bring that home with you on the weekend where you can regulate the temperature in your classroom because if your school is turning off the heat, <laughs> you know, and then the temperature is dropping to 50 degrees in your classroom and you have no control over that, then it's gonna affect your hatch rate. So just keep that in mind. So the first and second weekend, you know, you may want to think about that, your classroom conditions, um, and if your incubator is staying in school, if you have a way to monitor it to make sure everything is okay, like a webcam, that definitely comes in handy. Um, on your calendar, you'll notice the days in which you can start candling your egg. 
So commercially, you can do this to determine the quality and grade of your eggs and to see if there are any cracks in your eggs. So you might want to do this when you first get them to make sure that your shells are intact and good to go. Okay, during incubation, you can actually watch the growth of your embryo and see if there are any cracks forming on the inside and to make sure that you have um, a live chicken inside. The older the um, chick gets, the, the more opaque your egg will become because that chick is in there. So there'll be less light um, inside of your egg because you'll be looking at the dense body of your baby chick. Um, candle once between day six through 10. Candle a few, three to four different eggs. Don't do all of your eggs, just a couple. Okay, you don't wanna keep reaching in, pulling out eggs, and you don't wanna keep them out of the incubator long, um, just to compare and see where they are. And a flashlight works um, just fine for this process. So um, I have a, a flashlight here that I use, it's very bright. Um, so you can also use your a phone, but a small little flashlight like the one I'm holding up um, is absolutely fine. Okay, you can also have the kids engineer a shoebox. So they put the uh, flashlight on one end of that shoebox and the egg on the other. So that beam of light is concentrated to that egg and they can see and, and so that way they, you know, they can see what's going on inside the egg and they can see the eye develop and they can see the heartbeat and how quickly that heart is racing. When you can when you candle your eggs and anytime you touch or handle your eggs, wash your hands before touching the eggs. Okay. If you have gloves in the room, use a, a pair of sterile gloves. Um, if you do use your bare hand after you touch the egg, make sure you wash your hands because you don't want to um, get you know, any bacteria off the egg into your own body because that can make you sick too. All right, so just keep that in mind. Nobody touches the eggs unless they have clean, sterile hands, okay? Remember, again, these eggshells are poor. So if you, you know, kids are snotty and they touch and lick everything and, you know, pass on their germs. So if you, if you are sick and snotty and are passing on germs, if you touch that egg, you're introducing bacteria and germs to that developing embryo, that baby chick in there, that may cause it to lose viability um, or to have some type of genetic defect or developmental delayedness while it is developing. So just keep that in mind when you're talking about, you know, babies that are born with alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome, or babies of low birth rate born to mothers who smoke. So think about those things and how that fetus absorbs things. The same goes for a chick, okay? So um, that's the thing. If your primary goal is to have live chicks, only candle five to six eggs. You don't need to candle a bunch of eggs, okay? Don't keep them out of the incubator more than five minutes and don't get the eggs too close to a heat source because again, you don't want them to cook, all right? And then wash your hands before and after handling. Super, super, super important. Oh, what was that? So um, during the training, we, we took the, an opportunity to candle eggs, so you can do that. Um, so preparing for the hatch, if you notice, these eggs are not on an egg turner anymore. You have to take them off the egg turner all at the end of day 17. Remove the egg turner from your, um, your incubator, lay them on that grid that's at the bottom, okay? Um, you don't necessarily have to have cheesecloth up there, but if you want to catch some of those eggshell pieces in there, that's fine. But again, just make sure you watch, you know, what's happening in there. If you have to add extra sponges in there, do that. Cheesecloth, handy wipes or whatever, do that. But do not turn those eggs, okay? Do not. Now, you see the baby chick here with the eyeball developed and his feet are all curled and legs are bent here. Um, now, you can follow this link to a YouTube video that is a really cool um, way that is an animation of how this embryo develops. So you don't need to crack open an egg um, during this process and gross out your kids and scar them for life, okay? Now, if you're a high school teacher or a middle school teacher and this is part of a biology lesson and your kids can handle it, I leave that discretion totally up to you. But there are a lot of videos out there and this is just one which shows that process and how it happens. Also on the website that I shared with you, there are posters of what's happening inside the egg for each day. So there's no reason to crack open your eggs and scar your children with this, okay? And um, this PowerPoint is on the website, so you can click on that link and watch it on your own time. Um, remove the chicks from the incubator when they are dry and fluffy, okay? 
So 22 days from start, you should have some fluffy down little baby chicks, okay? If the chicks are not dry at the end of the school day, then leave the chicks in the incubator until the next morning, okay? But please make sure you remove the chicks from the incubator at least once a day, all right? If the incubator has good humidity levels, the so chicks may not dry. So in that case, place them in a brooder. And your brooder can be a box, it can be a plastic tub, but you need to have that heat lamp as a source of heat because these chicks cannot regulate their body temperatures just yet. Once they get their feathers, they are better able and are able to um, regulate their body temperature and they no longer need a heat lamp, okay? But don't put that heat lamp too close to your chicks because if they get too hot, then they will get that pasty butt because they're getting dehydrated and when they poop, it won't fall to the bottom of your brooder on the paper or the, the wood chips or whatever um, that I will provide you this year. Um, and then that can cause a vent block and that will kill your chick. So you you may have to adjust um, that. You may have to put another uh, thermometer down there where the chicks are to make sure that the temperature is not um, over 99 degrees in there, okay? So um, remove and discard all unhatched eggs 60 hours after the first chick hatches because they're not gonna hatch. All right, clean and disinfect your incubator when done. Now listen. One of the things that I realized last year, which you know prompted me to do the training, is your strongest chicks are going to hatch first. Those are going to be the alphas in the bunch, okay? And as they, they hatch in bunches, they'll form their own little family. Once you start mixing these chicks together, you have to keep an eye on them because they are little assassins. They will assassinate each other. Those, if you leave the chicks in the incubator as they hatch, watch them because if there is something genetically wrong with the chicks that are hatching the ones who were already hatched will go over to that egg and peck it to death before it even emerges out of the egg and that can affect your hatch rate <laughs> okay so you have to keep an eye on them this is animal behavior this is natural selection this is survival of the fittest and these cute adorable little baby chicks are natural born assassins Okay, if they sense there's something wrong, they will assassinate that chicken. It will never have a, a, a chance in life. So please keep an eye on their behavior and have the kids monitor what they are doing. And if you see anything happening, then you're gonna have to separate them out. So you might have to build a divider, put them in a, a smaller box within the contain within your brooder so that those other chicks are not attacking the weaker ones. In case of empower outage, you know, do what you can to keep them warm. Um, if that means taking them home, then please take them home, but take your heat lamp and some water for them as well. Um, they can survive sometimes below 90 degrees for up to 18 hours, but you want to keep them at that steady, you know, temperature of, of at least 99, 98 degrees after um, they are born and hatched. Like I said, your brooder can be. Um, any kind of box that you know you can see your chicks what's going on you've got water um, you need a water feeder for them a waterer an automatic waterer, and you do need an automatic feeder i will give you starter feed to start off with your chicks will be in the classroom with you for one week so they will need food um, they will not eat as soon as they're born they probably will take 24 to 48 hours before they really begin to eat but they will need water to drink they swallow the last bit of yolk that's inside of the egg um, as they're uh, hatching. So they're, it's not that they're starving, okay? They will sleep a lot. Make sure that you have a way for them not to drown in their watering dish. So um, some teachers put marbles in there so that way they can have access to the water without falling head first in because you'll see they'll sleep in every, you know, nodding out with their head right in the water. So you don't want them to die. Um, I will provide everybody with some pine um, shavings to go in the bottom of your, um, of your brooder, um, but you will need to supply the heat source, your automatic waterers and feeders, um, and a container for your brooder for your baby chicks after they hatch. Put a thermometer in your brooder box. You want that temperature to be um, between 85, 90 degrees um, Fahrenheit. You may have to adjust the height of the lamp, like I said, but um, do not add a higher wattage bulb, okay? And you can get these heat lamp sources from Tractor Supply or Southern States. Um, I'm not sure if Walmart will carry them um, at this time of year or not, but you can find them from any type of farm supply store. So for long-term brooding, you're gonna need to leave that heat lamp on 24 hours a day, 
Okay, so yeah, you'll have to leave it on. You want to make sure that it's not near anything that uh, it can melt or catch fire. All right, so keep that in mind as well. Um, you will have a week, so make sure your box is big enough for the chicks to move around and run around in. They will need fresh water daily. Marbles in the dish keeps them from drowning. The litter, the bedding, I will give you some um, pine um, shavings to go on the bottom of your box. I suggest you put newspaper lining down there first or paper towels or, or brown paper bags, but something underneath even if you have construction paper underneath of those shavings okay because they're little pooping machines and when in the end you know you can roll it up it's easy to toss out and and discard and that um, making sure that they have fresh uh, water every day is a assignment you can give to your kids and make them leaders or caretakers for the day like I say you will have longer in the classroom with them this year to give the kids a longer opportunity to interact with the baby chicks to observe the baby chicks and to take on responsibility for um, caring for them so that they learn what does you know a, a young life need in order to um, to survive and make it okay and also you want to keep away from drafts they do chicks are social creatures they 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 you know are used to flocks so try not to isolate one chick alone because it's not good for their mental and emotional state okay so we want them to be healthy both physically and mentally um, as they hatch okay so um, there are lots of things it is survival of the fittest um, making sure the facility is proper so you see in this picture here at the bottom that there is no egg turner in this styrofoam box okay take your egg turner out because it gives the chicks a better chance to survive once they hatch okay and it really is survival of the um, fittest the strongest um, the strongest of your chicks will hatch first please 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 keep an eye on them um, last year we had um, an island of misfit toys our scratch and dent chicks we um, kept them alive and we homed them all together um, and they are living well you know some of them did have some genetic defects that of course we couldn't see because it was internal but on the outside they look fine some had some mobility issues some you know just kind of fell over constantly but we gave them a chance to see what would happen if you know the other if we separated them out from the other chicks and gave them a chance to live how long would they live so um they didn't make it past six months and they just kind of died of natural causes out on their own but um you know that just goes to show that nature has a way and it is a, a it's an amazing opportunity to talk to your kids about creatures people who are born different that have you know a developmental delay or some type of physical challenge um and so connecting your kids to that emotional um learning is really important because they're going to want to care for these baby chicks and when they're so little and cute it, it's really easy for them to want to protect the chicks so that they all have a chance to live and so finding lessons that will support and engage your kids in talking about people among us who are different you know who have challenges who you know have to keep up with the strongest of us and you know teaching them to care for people the way they care for these young chicks and giving them a chance in life and you know giving them that they deserve a chance to live too and so do our chicks so our chicks do not go to be killed all right they do go to two local um family run farms and um we split them in half between the two farms and um they are raised for egg production so all of our eggs that come from the hatchery are very big egg producers so when you go to a restaurant here in virginia beach and you see um fresh local eggs then keep in mind that these farms are literally supplying eggs to our restaurants that are right here so our project is helping with the virginia beach food system so um they do live out everyone except for the roosters of course because roosters do not lay eggs so those are the ones most likely to be dinner um, on someone's table because they don't lay eggs and we need eggs. So um, yeah, that, that's what happens to the baby chicks when you bring them back to us. They go to farms and they live out their best egg producing lives. Um, those eggs also make it to our local food banks as well. So um, this project is helping the entire Virginia Beach community. So um, just keep that in mind. If you do have some that are scratch and dent, 
and are deformed, please separate them out from the other chicks so that they do not get assassinated. Please understand these are little assassins, okay? And you know, this is a great lesson in genetics for kids as well because chicks have to adapt. Animals have to adapt to changes in their surroundings. And I will find the a lesson plan about bird beaks and the adaptation and changes in bird beaks to better to best be suited for the types of food that is available in their environment. So as the environment changes, our animals have to adapt and change too. However, you don't want an animal with a serious genetic defect breeding with others because then you'll have a species that will have this defect and lead to its extinction and so nature has a way okay for um and you can talk about baby gazelles and baby deer that if they have so much time to learn how to run because predators are constantly looking for them so for any of our chicks that are born with defects in the wild the moms will abandon them and there's something in nature predator that's looking for a meal so either way they become part of the food web and the the energy cycle Okay, so that's another way to tie that in to, you know, what happens in, in the wild when these animals are born with defects and they can't get up and run? What's most likely to happen to them? And so that food web and, and niches and habitats and what they need to survive and how these babies are born to run is part of their survival. And so that opens up a world of other lessons that you can cover with your kids in the classroom as they make these um, observa observations in animal behaviors and talking about which are the strongest. And these are a few of our scratch and dents right here that I uh, made it. This one here with the little cupcake on him. Um, he had a, a, a vent issue. Um, when he was young and so this was one of his spa days where he was getting a bath and he loved to be blow dried or she loved to be blow dried. You see his little feathers are starting to come out. Um, we didn't sex the chicks last year, but um, the home where our scratch and dent chicks went, she absolutely loved them. And so she had fun, you know, dressing them up in little um, cupcake cups and papers and stuff like that, giving them mirrors to look at themselves. So when I tell you we love our baby chicks, we love our baby chicks and we keep them alive. So late hatching chicks oftentimes have some type of defect or they're just not as strong as the others. So please separate any chicks with defects from the group, especially if you see the group bullying them or attacking them, you have to separate them out, okay? It is okay. Um, to group those defective chicks together because they'll create their own little family. And again, that opens up another lesson about socio-emotional um, learning for your kids in the classroom through these types of animal observations and behaviors. And then of course, you know, not all chicks will hatch. And so um, you do can talk to the kids about, you know, what possibly could have gone wrong you know, the embryo just wasn't viable. Maybe fertilization didn't happen, you know, or or something else happened within that egg. So um, some of those need a little extra help. And so there's lots of lessons embedded within the embryology program that you can share with your kids. But the whole point is to introduce these life lessons, to learn about the life cycle. You can add animal adaptations, genetic changes and mutations, um, what does it take to uh, care for your animals? What do they need in their environment to survive? And then as a caretaker, you know, the responsibility of that record keeping as, you know, time goes on through the project as well. So there's lots of things that you can cover science-wise in here. I um, mean, at the training, we also did an egg stand where you stood on eggs and we tested the um, structure of an egg, the strength of it. And so um, I will put those things on the website as well. So if you want to introduce that to your kids throughout the month and do some of those experiments, you absolutely can. You can also make rubber bouncing eggs by soaking your eggs in vinegar. Um, that is a great classroom experiment to find out the acidity of things and how it eats away the calcium of the egg to create a soft spongy egg that you can bounce. Um, so there you can dissect an egg so you can learn how eggs are, you know, delivery systems for birthing more chicks and you know and how that structure is sound and so there is a lesson plan already on the website for you for that so um, hopefully with all the resources that I have there you have an entire month to use eggs in your classroom to enhance science to teach your kids you know different variables and changes and all different kinds of experiments that they can engage in during the project that will help them with that scientific process 
and understanding um, data and data collection and observations and manipulatives. So natural selection, this was our island of misfit toys as they got older. So you see we changed the container until they built their home, but most of them um, lived from March 31st was their birth date until August 18th, 2022. So we gave them a chance to see what would happen. And that chicky mom who adopted them ended up getting more chicks. And now she is a full blown chick mom. <laughs> So this is me. I'm your 4 H agent, Jonette Mungo for the City of Virginia Beach. If you have any questions, you can reach me by email. You can also call my office. Um, but if you need me to come to your classroom, let me know. I will come out to your classroom, see what's going on, meet your kids, and um, do an experiment or two. So just let me know what you need from me because I love coming to classrooms and doing science experiments. Thank you so much. I appreciate you watching this. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, and I am here to help. So your 4-H agent, Joe Nett saying so long. <laughs>